From the Territorial State House State Park Museum in Fillmore, Utah, you're listening to the weekly voice of the Old Capitol Storytelling Festival. Brought to you by the Friends of the Territorial State House and Utah Pioneer Heritage Arts. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Old Capitals podcast. This is Brianna Smith, your host. We are back here with Scott Bassett. Um, at the Topaz Museum. We interviewed him previously and just enjoyed his story so much that we asked for him to come back and so we could interview him again. Um, So Scott, will you just give us a walkthrough of the museum, of what people can see when they attend this? Sure, I'd be glad to. Um, The museum opened officially in January of 2014, but we did not have our exhibits ready at that time. So we just had an art show, and the beautiful art that we had on display, people enjoyed very, very much for a two-year period. Then in January of this year, 2017, they began installing our permanent exhibit. That was finished by July when we had our grand opening, and since that time, we've had thousands of people come and visit the museum and enjoy it. That's amazing. It is absolutely beautiful. So this this is what you get when you come. Um, We have a very happy, welcoming, docent staff, and everyone that works for the Topaz Museum is a volunteer. There are no paid staff members at all. And so our docents, we just love them and appreciate them so much, but they'll welcome you here, and then they'll, we have a couple of short They're each about six minutes in length videos that talk about internment, that explain the internment process and what happened here in Utah's West Desert. And um, we have in that room, in the projection room where the videos are shown, we have some beautiful, absolutely stunning shell art work. Now, this part of the state used to be underwater 16,000 years ago, Lake Bonneville. And when the Japanese Americans came, they found mounds of shells about five miles west of the west fence. And they would go out and just gather these shells up, bring them back, wash them in Clorox, lay them out to dry, and then create absolutely beautiful shell jewelry and, and artwork. It's beautiful. That's my favorite part of the whole museum it is. is that. It's there, there are, that's what a lot of our visitors say, and I, I couldn't agree with them more. Um, after that, then it's pretty much just a self-guided tour. Um, it is chronological in nature. Okay. We invite you to come into the museum where the exhibits are. And first you see uh, the Moshita family. And they are all tagged along with their luggage. And they were given a number by the government. Every family had a number. And mm. they used that throughout camp. And so they have their tags on. Their luggage has their tags on. And from that point, you proceed basically to your right, and you learn about what was going on in the United States prior to World War II, some of the prejudicial laws that were on the books, etc. Okay. Then you learn about the um, executive order issued by President Roosevelt on February 19th, 1942. 1942, yes. <laughs> and 1943, sorry, 1943. And then... Um, Will you explain a little bit about th- what that was? You bet. Um, President Roosevelt, it was 1942, come to think of it. <laughs> One of those okay, years. February 19th, 1942. Um, it was an executive order by the president which ordered all people of Japanese ancestry that were living in the West Coast area, that would be 100 miles from the coast inland, in Washington, Oregon, and Arizona, and all of the state of California. If mm-hmm. you lived in that area, it was declared the military zone. And you mm-hmm. had about a six-week period to move voluntarily or the government would move you. Just if you were Japanese, correct? Just if you were, uh, yes, of Japanese wow. ancestry. And um, of those people that were moved, about two-thirds of them were U.S. citizens. They were hmm. born here. Um, the older ones that had immigrated to the United States, they were not citizens because the laws at the time didn't allow them to be citizens. Huh. Unless you were black or white, you could not be a citizen of the United States at that really? time. Really? Up until 1952. And that wasn't that long ago. No, that wasn't <laughs> like, that, that long was ago. That was not that long ago that in really history. Was not that's that an, long ago. That's crazy. And um, then talks about okay, evacuation is in place. We got to be moving. So it talks about all the things they had to do to get uh, get ready to move. Ironically, um, you the camps like the land for Topaz was not purchased until June of 1942, but they had to leave their homes in April. So mm-hmm. where were they? There, that's a real disconnect. Where was the government going to put these people? Yeah. Well, they housed them at 16 temporary relocation sites, temporary mm-hmm. assembly centers, and they were basically at fairgrounds and racetracks. No so way. The majority of the people from Topaz who were from the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area, 
they ended up at either the Tanferan or the Santa Anita racetracks, and mm. they lived in horse stalls oh while they goodness. were waiting for Topaz to be built. So you, you hear about that story. We actually have a plat that shows how large the city of Topaz was, where the buildings were all laid out. We have a wonderful apartment that would have been an apartment for four. Um, and in that apartment, you can find what the government would have provided you. That would have been four army cots and bedding and then a coal stove. There are many other things in that room, period things, and they, th- the families had to furnish those, basically. Hmm. They could order them from the catalog. They could buy them at camp. They could make them at camp, a lot of leftover lumber. Wow. Um, so exiting the apartment, you see there's a little section that talks about the interaction between Delta and Topaz. Mm-hmm. And then you can go outside, and we have one half of an original recreation hall that was on site. Oh, wow. And you go in there and you just get a real feel for what it would have been like to yeah, live. Yeah, I walked in there and I just kind of cr- I cringed. Yeah. I it's it's kind of disheartening. Yeah, it's you know 112 degrees in the summer and mm. below zero in the winter. It it was hmm. it, it gives you a real feel for it. Yeah. Then you come back in and we have a wonderful art gallery. Topaz was known for its artwork, um, so we have wonderful art to dis- to show. And then you end up. Um, And a lot of artifacts to be seen. And then we conclude with the Constitution Room, talking about the rights that were taken away from these people. people. Some people, you know, come, spend 15 minutes. Others spend three hours and come back the next day because there's so much. It just depends on what you want. What you want. No, that is amazing. So with all of your guests and people coming to visit the museum, I'm sure you've had a lot of interesting experiences. Um from those people sharing with you. Could you tell us Sure. one of those? I'm kind of always reminded of one experience because, I mean, it was a very sad time, and a lot of people lost absolutely everything. Um, We know of people that ended up in mental hospitals, basically, Mm. because they could not deal with the aspects of internment and what it did to their family and what it did to them personally. But I often think about the story of a Hawaiian lady who came, and she was a young girl in camp. And she told me her story because I I just apologized. I said, this was such a terrible time. And she said, but not for my family. And I said, please tell me more. Uh And she said, she said, you know, my father worked for his father in Hawaii. And his father was a big businessman. He owned a lot of businesses, had a lot of plantations. And my, my father was just always gone because he was Mm -hmm. always working for his dad on all of these business endeavors and different things and when we came to Topaz she said we'd been here for about maybe a couple of weeks and he was contacted by Dave Tatsuno and Dave is a big name in Topaz come and we'll tell you all about Dave he's got some (laughs) great stories but anyway Dave contacted him and he said would you help us with the stores with setting up the businesses and different things because we know you've got that background and her father said yes he would be glad to and then he went to work for the stores but he worked from eight to five (laughs) <laughs> and she said that was the very first time in their lives that they had ever had any family time. Really? Because wow. the father didn't have to, you know, work after hours and mm-hmm. different things. And she said we were actually one of the very last families to leave camp. Really? Because my father did not want to go. Huh. This was a great time in his life. That's an amazing story. That's good to hear a little upside it is. of this. Yeah. Um, even though it was slightly a horrific thing absolutely but it's good to always hear positive that came out of it too and i'm sure they did have to spend a lot of family quality time just being in this little cubicle that (laughs) they were in so um okay well if you want to hear the rest of the story come visit the topaz museum at 50 west main street delta if you're coming from the north take the nephi exit if you're coming from the south take the meadow exit and we hope to see you here in delta Subscribe to our podcast at oldcapitalstoryfest.com. That's capital C-A-P-I-T-O-L. Visit our website to dive deeper into our weekly stories and to find other folks who love history, heritage, and modern pioneering. And join us next week to meet another friend and hear another story. Still here where stories never end.